great and gracious God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Because you and you alone, God, are our strength, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. So I grew up in a different world than my kids are growing up in. I'm sure this is the same is true for you. I, I was explaining to Eliza and Liam, five and three and a half, five and a half and three and a half the other day, that when I was young, we didn't all carry phones around with us. They were attached to walls with wires, and that's where they stayed. And they didn't have cameras in them. This shocked them. To be fair, it probably didn't shock them any more than the stories my parents used to tell me about party lines and about sitting of an evening and watching a radio as a show played. Then again, maybe my kids are easily shocked. Maybe I was easily shocked as a kid. Um, last summer, we spent a few days in St. Louis on a family vacation. Both my parents were from southern Illinois, so it felt good to me uh, to get back there and spend a few days. We visited a couple of great museums. They have some really, really great places for kids there. But I really wanted to show them the arch because that's St. Louis, right? You've seen it, haven't you? Have you been up in the Gateway Arch? To get to the top, you climb inside a, a little round tram, I think they call it, and you ride and it turns you and twists you. And, and as much as I wanted my kids to experience that, we were a little tight on time and honestly, I don't know if they would have enjoyed the clamped, claustrophobic ride of the little trams to the top. So I wanted them to at least see this arch. So we climbed in the car one afternoon and drove down to the riverfront to show them the arch. The highway happened to dump us at about 4th Street, I think, which honestly, by this point in the adventure, was close enough. So Google Street View will help me show you and share this experience because I wasn't shooting video or audio at the time. I was driving, and I wasn't expecting a sermon illustration. So we're driving up 4th Street, north, and we're looking to the east, or, or I'm, I'm looking a little to the north, wanting to look to the east, and we get about here, and I tell the kids, okay, look to the east. And I pointed, because I didn't expect them to know which way was east, because um, I want you to see this arch. And so then we started telling them, look out the side of the car, and our view progressed as we looked to the east, like this, and we... We walked it down this building again, and then we got to here, and there was this collective, whoa, from the back seat. It was one of these beautiful, genuine, take your breath away, whoa. Sadly, I'm afraid this is a sound that we are learning not to make. A little less than a year ago, I was struck with the notion of, of wonder, and I believe that it's wonder that enables us to have moments that leave us with nothing more than a, whoa, but I also believe it's harder than ever to have these experiences. The primary reason, I think, is, is that it's getting harder for, and harder for us to experience wonder is that we just know too much, or we think we do. I mean, it's been a decade now since that magician who wore a mask for this, this uh, miniseries on TV showed us all the secrets that reveal all the magic tricks that we used to marvel at. But I mean, even, even though you knew it wasn't real, there was something about a really well-performed illusion that would just leave you absolutely awestruck. So even if you haven't watched those shows that reveal the secrets behind all the magic tricks... If you want to know the secrets, you can. I took the time to Google um, secrets of magic, and in just over half a second, I received 58 and a half million opportunities to, to learn about the secrets of magic. We don't have room left for wonder. I think this has always been true of, of people as they got older. As you understand more about the world, there's less room left for wonder. But we also get tired of wonder. I mean, it takes energy to have your breath taken away. A day of thrills exhausts you even if you're just riding a roller coaster. Does it really burn calories to ride a roller coaster? 
Yes, it does. Studies have shown, in fact, that, that a visit to a theme park is as good as a workout at a gym for you. And that's, it's not just the walking around between thrills. It's the experiences that we have, even if we are kind of sedentary, are a workout for us. So just like exercising, just like not exercising, I'm sorry, causes our bodies to atrophy, I think not wondering causes our souls to atrophy. I believe one of the best things that we can do to prepare this year for our celebration of the birth of Jesus is to rekindle our sense of wonder. So today and for the next three Sundays, we hope to do exactly this. And you're invited along for the ride. There's a lot of fear in the world right now. In fact, I suppose it's a first world problem to think that there's fear in the world right now and that there's not always more than enough fear to go around in the world. But there is. And some of our fear is of change in general. And some of our fear is of the, exact, of, of the specific changes that we see around us, that we read about, and that we sense in the world around us. We know that change will continue to happen. Change has been happening all of our lives. And change will outlive us. But if we were always and only fear averse, then no one would ever have children. Because there's no surer way to bring change to your life than to have children or to spend it around children. So even though there's a lot of fear in the world, we have to remember that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I believe that rekindling our sense of wonder is absolutely essential for us developing a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Or as the common English Bible translates it, a powerful, loving, and self-controlled spirit. And fear damages our souls. But wonder restores our souls. Healthy souls live from a sense of power and love and self-control, not out of a sense of fear. And I think... I think that fear is on the increase for the same reason that wonder is on the decrease because we think we know it all. We believe that knowledge is power, so we think that the more we know, the more power we have. From a popular perspective, science seems to have just about everything all figured out. But I checked with our own, I, I, I used to say resident, but she doesn't live here anymore. We had a rocket, scient a rocket scientist, a literal rocket scientist in our congregation for quite a few years. And I checked with her on this. Science is not even beginning to have it all figured out, no matter how we might understand it or see it portrayed. We don't, and we won't, and we can't have everything figured out. Certainty sounds awesome, but it's an illusion. So instead of seeking certainty, instead of wallowing in self-pity for lack of certainty, let's regain our sense of wonder. Fear inhibits wonder. Fear threatens to choke wonder out of our lives. But I think the opposite of fear is, is a yawn or boredom that comes from a lack of expectation or hope. And, and a life full of yawns is like a life full of fear. Together they combat our need for wonder. Today's scripture readings are written to a people who have a sense of wonder. The time is coming, declares the Lord, writes Jeremiah, when I will fulfill my gracious promise. The people to whom Jeremiah wrote this are under siege by the king of Babylon in Jerusalem. Jeremiah himself is confined to the guard, to the, to, to the, inside the gate of the, guard, the king's guard. The city is under siege. It seems that all hope is lost. Or almost. And all hope is gone except that this word from God comes through Jeremiah that says, the time is coming when I will fulfill my gracious promise. Wonder brings us hope. Without wonder, there's no hope. And with wonder, hope and possibility are always present. Because with wonder, one realizes that that the world depends and life depends on something or someone beyond the self. So Jeremiah closes this passage with the one, 
talking about the one to come, the one to deliver hope and to fulfill God's gracious promise. And he says, he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Now you and I read this and we know that Jeremiah is foretelling Jesus. And perhaps he was, but I want you to know this too. The king of Judah at this very moment that, that they're laying under siege and they don't know what tomorrow might bring was named Zedekiah. And Zedekiah's name means the Lord is our righteousness. So Jeremiah wasn't just giving some abstract people in the future a, an opportunity for hope. Hope was coming, he told them. Like God would tell us, hope is coming. In, in one sense, the future promised Messiah, but for those who live with a sense of wonder, hope is or can be available even right now. The gospel reading for this morning is a little more challenging. It's, it's full of the kind of language that, that would have been Jesus' day's version of the latest, the world is ending blockbuster movie. We tend to read these passages either from a doom and gloom perspective or we simply ignore them as ancient literature. But if we have a sense of wonder, we can't do either of those. Apocalyptic language, which Luke's passage in 21 is, um, is not written to the scientifically, rationally minded who believe that there's some real world correlation with every single thought and detail of the text. I mean, just look at verse 32 where Jesus says, I assure you that this generation won't pass away until everything has happened. Really? Everything has happened? What, what does he mean by everything? And is he using some different use of the word generation here? Because it doesn't make any sense. Well, yes and no. He's using this kind of language to tell those who are listening the same thing that Jeremiah was telling those who listened to him. He was telling them that God is near. But you have to learn to pay attention. He's telling them, as he's telling us, that God has not abandoned you. That no matter how bad things seem, no matter how out of control the world seems to be, God has not abandoned God's people. Jesus told these things in this language to those who have a sense of wonder. I have a three and a half year old at home who has a sense of wonder. He shared a dream with me the other morning that um, was full of apocalyptic language. And so I'll, I'll share it with you. Um, I had this conversation. He just got out of bed. I asked him if he had any, any dreams the night before. He said, yeah, a really, really, really bad dream. So I asked for more. And he said, in his dream, there were zillions of bad guys. Really bad guys. Coming to kill the whole earth but not Antarctica. That's a quote. <laughs> Liam saved the world. By himself, he defeated all those zillions of bad guys. Because there is nothing a three and a half year old can't do. But if we're paralyzed by fear, if we've lost our sense of wonder, it begins to feel like there's nothing we can do. So however you might react to listening to the dream of a three and a half year old, you don't yawn. Neither do you yawn when you watch anything that J.J. Abrams has produced or directed. You've heard of J.J. Abrams. If you don't know him by name, you know some of his work anyway. He's, he's the, the, the mastermind behind the Lost series and many other shows since then. He's the lead imagination behind the latest reboot of the Star Trek movies, which are awesome if you haven't seen them. If that's not impressive enough, Disney that came to own the Star Wars franchise pursued Abrams to bring the story back to the big screen um, next month, I think. So how does so much creativity and wonder come out of the mind of one man? It's at least partly due to Tannen's magic store in New York City. And this is not to be confused, I think, with Biff Tannen. <laughs> Though I would imagine somehow there's some sort of um, connection there. So Ma Tannen's magic store sells mystery boxes. There's this box that's labeled to where you can't tell what's in it. It's $15 for the box, but they guarantee... There's at least $50 worth of magic 
inside the mystery box. So Abram's got his own mystery box at Tannen's Music Magic Store over 30 years ago. And he still hasn't opened it. <laughs> He's drawn to wonder about all the possibilities that might be in that box. And leaving the mystery a mystery has been part of his inspiration. Because mystery inspires imagination and hope for the future. And as soon as you open the box, you know that that's all there is inside it. As soon as you think you have everything figured out, you've run out of space to wonder. And we run out, when we run out of space to wonder, we drastically increase the opportunity for fear to take over. So may we, as we prepare for the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, may we open ourselves to the wonder that creates space for God, for God to act, for God to work, for God to lead, for God to fulfill God's gracious promise. Welcome to Advent. Welcome to wonder.